So good evening, everyone. I am Emily Baranowski. I'm the Deputy Director with Phi Alpha Delta, and I'd like to welcome you to Trends in Cannabis Law, which is a part of the Phi Alpha Delta webinar series. Um, just as a reminder, as the internet is, of course, extremely busy right now with various webinars and general usage, uh, there may be some times when bandwidth may be an issue. We do want to make sure everyone knows that tonight's presentation is being recorded and will be available on our PAD YouTube channel tomorrow. So if you do drop out for a moment, don't worry, you're not going to miss anything. We'll make sure you get everything you need to know. If you have questions during the presentation, please use the chat feature and we'll get to those after the presentation. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Michelle Isherwood, international board member, who will be moderating this webinar. Thank you in advance to our guest presenters, Judith Castle and Tanisha Henson. This time, I'll turn it over to Michelle. Michelle, it's all yours. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, this is a really exciting topic, and I'm glad that we were able to present this webinar on in, in cannabis law. Um, I would like to introduce our, our panelists for tonight, um, Judith Castle and Tanisha Henson. Um, I'll give them a chance to introduce themselves. But again, like Emily said, please, um, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. And um, thank you again, Emily and the executive office for facilitating our webinar series. Again, thank you. And Judith and Tanisha, would you like to introduce yourself and give us a bit about your background and, and then we'll get started. Sure. Uh, Judith Castle. I work for Cannabis Law PA, and the PA is really partners. Uh, we represent clients all over the United States. We represent medical marijuana, recreational marijuana, hemp, CBD. We represent growers, processors, dispensaries. We represent laboratories, physician groups. We even represent the entity that provides the CME for medical doctors in the course on medical marijuana. I started this practice about four and a half years ago when Pennsylvania was on the cusp of uh, passing the Medical Marijuana Act. And we, our law firm had always been in regulatory law, so it seemed to be a good transition to enter into this practice, which we knew would be heavily regulated. And as you can imagine, it is. Um, for the last four years, it has been an exciting ride. As Tanisha will probably tell you, I am a fan of this being a practice group for any lawyers that are interested. It is never a dull moment. It is always exciting. It will pull in and hopefully I will be able to discuss tonight how much it impacts on other areas of law, including constitutional law, as Tanisha knows all too well. She's a student in my medical marijuana class. And we're both proud to say that it is the first medical marijuana class um, given at any Pennsylvania law school. And so we are cutting edge on a lot of different fronts. We um, want to make this seminar something that you can use and hopefully it's it's a lot of practical knowledge. And also uh, hopefully we'll have enough time at the end to answer all kinds of questions no matter what they are. Um, so that's me in a nutshell, Tanisha. I'm Tanisha, I am the form, immediate former justice for the Pepper chapter here at Widener University. And as my professor said, I am uh, in her medical marijuana class this semester, and it has been endlessly fascinating and has touched on so many different areas and just completely opened up my eyes. So I'm very excited to be a part of this and excited that you all wanted to hear this. So without further ado, we will get started. Great. Um, as you can see on the screen, hopefully. Um, this is a map. This is the most updated map I can find that uh, you can see which states have legalized medical marijuana and which states have legalized recreational marijuana. I will note that the gray states have not legalized marijuana in any form. And as you can also tell pretty quickly, they're in the minority. So I want to just quickly go over the fact that to date, there are 11 states plus the Washington DC area that have legalized recreational marijuana. And that's Alaska, California, Colorado, Illinois, Maine, Massachusetts, Michigan, Nevada, Oregon, Vermont, and Washington. I will note that Vermont has not legalized recreational sales, but they have legalized home grow. So you can grow marijuana in Vermont for personal use. 
Now, there are many other states that have varying legislation ready and pending, but COVID-19 has put kind of the kibosh or at least a stall on some of the other legislation that's being considered. Pennsylvania itself is considering some rec, as well as Delaware and New Jersey. I want to turn to the next slide briefly, just to give you an example. Most states will divide up their state into either regions or groups of counties when they are looking at placement of marijuana facilities. This is an example of Pennsylvania. They divided the state into six regions and they put uh, an even number of growers in each of those regions. And then they, as far as dispensaries, they looked more at more specific population areas and granted permits in highly populated areas like Pitt, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. So I'm gonna go to slide four, I think at this point, and talk more specifically about applic the application process. It is a lot of the bread and butter of our firm's practice area. We assist applicants in creating their application. And it's a very time consuming part uh, that requires, most applications are a couple hundred pages at least, many are over a thousand pages. So it's very labor intensive. I often joke that it's one of the most fun times of the year when I and my associates have these applications to, to uh, create because it's usually round the clock work where we're calling each other at two in the morning and figuring out which pot, pot of coffee that we are on because they're very, very time sensitive. Um, the states usually open up the application process for a very narrow window. It's usually 30, 60 days. And so it's a lot of work over a short amount of time. Many people have asked me, is there a difference between the applications for recreational and medical. And there are some, but there are more similarities than there are differences. For instance, all applications, whether it be medical or recreational, will look to seek to get owner information. That means all of the principals um, will have to have background checks. They will have to submit resumes. They will have to have CVs. They will have to um, submit their financials. Um, Speaking of financial, the company that's applying will have to submit both past, present, and future financials. So in other words, where's your money coming from? Where is it sitting right now? And how do you plan to use it in the company? All of the applications will require diagrams of the site. They will require inventory processes. Also, quality control procedures and security procedures are huge in both types of applications. Now, I want to go a little bit deeper into the application process and talk about really specifics. And this is where I said it's um, it's really good knowledge. Whether you're a would-be law student, you are a law student, or you are a practicing attorney, you can help with the application process. Um, you don't necessarily need to be a lawyer, though I think it really helps in terms of um, figuring out how the application could fit into the regulatory structure. But certainly we have had law clerks help us with some of the writing, drafting, proofing of the applications. Now I told you that it usually they usually open up the window for like 45 to 90 days. Um, and during that time, a lot of work needs to happen. Um, there are, they, they have to find sites, specific sites, and do a lot of work on the site, actual site that they are proposing um, to have their medical marijuana facility. These application processes draw hundreds of applicants. It's very competitive. And um, almost only the very, very qualified and the very um, substantive and detailed applications win permits. Um, they, they, like I said, they have to include their financials and, um, they, and they will have to include what's called a Gantt chart. For those of you who may not be familiar with a Gantt chart, that is where they say where every penny of their cash is gonna be used for capital improvements. So if you have a plumber coming in in week three for four days and you're spending $15,000, that goes on this chart and this chart flows out from the moment you become a award winner to the moment your facility is up and running. You need to have those type of very specific Get charts. You'll have to have your zoning approvals to some degree. 
In other words, if it's a by right, if your ordinance provides by right that you're allowed to build there, then you just have to provide a copy of the ordinance. If there's a conditional use involved or a variance involved, you need to go further. And so you have to include those kinds of things in your application. They want very detailed uh, descriptions to demonstrate your knowledge and substantive ability to grow or process marijuana. And so uh, my clients have to supply the substantive knowledge. I write it for them, but they have to supply the substantive knowledge because I don't know how to grow marijuana. <laughs> I probably do by this point, but when I started, I certainly didn't know how to grow it. And so these operational descriptions get down to the very fine granular details of the timing of the amount of water each plant needs at which um, particular time of day, how much light is required based on the growing season. Sometimes they need 18 hours of light. Sometimes they need only 12 hours of light. How much fertilizer the plants get, how much pesticides, which kind, who's gonna administer, how that's gonna be tracked. Um, details on the HVAC system. Um, how you're going to trim the plants. That's a, that's a huge activity for those of you who are familiar with cultivation of marijuana. Trimming is a big activity and processing is a big activity. These, these plants are, um, are processed in medical marijuana states into everything from uh, tinctures, uh, vaping oil, uh, even suppositories. Um, there are tampons that are um, uh, infused with medical marijuana as well. So all of those end products have to be described on how you're going to create them, how you're going to package them, how you're going to label them. Sample labels have to be submitted. Um, obviously, detailed security has to be part of the application. For instance, you have to decide what kind of cameras that you are going to have and exactly where you're going to place them on the site maps and what those cameras can achieve. Can they pick up a person's face with the lowest of lights? Can they make a clear photo for the police to use if necessary? All of those things have to be described. Other security features that are usually described are things like retinal scans for the employees, barcodes or employee cards, um, RFID tagging on the plants. There's an expression in marijuana that's called seed to sale. Um, in medical marijuana states, they want everyone to be able to track a particular seed all the way from when it's purchased from a by the um, grower processor all the way till that becomes like vape oil in a dispensary. It's called seed to sale tracking. So they start with RFI technology tags on the uh, seeds or the plants. Everything gets entered into a statewide electronic system that tracks it. And as that plant gets moved around either within the grow facility or as it pro is processed or as it's transported, all of that gets logged every single time. Now, if you're thinking, as most people are thinking at this juncture, oh my gosh, are they are they carting nuclear waste or are they talking about a you know plant? The security and the level of detail that's scrutinized in medical marijuana far exceeds any CVS or Rite Aid that you've ever seen. And I, my opinion is that the Rite Aid and the CVS handle so much more dangerous drugs than these medical marijuana outlets, but. This is the world we live in and the states that are legalizing it, they want to make sure that there is no, they want to give no reason to the federal government to come in and supersede their authority. So, um, we're on background checks. Not only do all of the existing principles need to get background checks, but as the operating entity um, hires people, those new people have to get background checks. Now what happens is you make an appointment to go to someplace like Identico, you get your fingerprints um, taken and you submit your other information and that gets processed first through the state police and then through the FBI. After that's complete, um, those results will be given to the state agency that oversees medical marijuana or marijuana. And then your state agency will let you know whether you're allowed to hire uh, that particular employee. During COVID-19, that it becomes a problem. For instance, in Maryland and West Virginia and Ohio and Pennsylvania, because the people are not in the office at these state agencies, there's no one to say, yes, you can hire that employee. So there are literally thousands of employees ready, ready to be hired at these facilities that cannot start work. As you know, unemployment right now is a huge problem 
And so um, we're fighting right now um, diligently to um, get the states to waive that requirement, at least for 90 days, and let people start working. I'll tell you just, be, we'll leave this application process in a second. I just want to tell you for your for your own benefit, if you are working on applications, things that you can do for your client or for yourselves, if you decide to go into this business, that will really improve your application. Adding pictures. Can you imagine reading a thousand pages of block type words. Nobody wants to do that. It's reviewer fatigue. So what we try to do is if we're talking about a certain piece of equipment, we you know, get that picture and we in, and put it into the application. We try to make the application as professional as possible. We keep every, all the formatting very systematic. We add color to all the headers and bullet points um, consistently. So it doesn't look, you know, garish, but um, we put in pictures. We want it to be smooth reading. We want it to be professional. We want it to be interesting. Um, another thing is, is putting in that extra detail about what you're describing. Also, um, it's very important to um, try to uplift the entire community. Um, so you'll want to talk about how you can address the disparities in um, economics in different communities. You want to lift up disadvantaged groups. You want to make sure that there's full participation from all different minority classes and um, the veterans class and disabled class. You want to make sure that you include those people as vendors, as employees, as principals, as leaders um, in, in your organization. That's a very big plus when you're doing these applications. If you say you have $10 million, you need to be able to, to demonstrate that you have $10 million is, is the bottom line. Say good things but make sure that you can document them. So if you're talking about lifting up um, minorities and you wanna make sure that you incorporate, you actually go out to the community, you find minority businesses, you ask them if they would like to participate in ownership of your, of your, of your company if you get the permit. And so there's lots of really good ways that medical marijuana is not only just um, helping, medical marijuana is not just helping people who have some serious conditions, but it's also really helping the communities that it, it, it uh, ends up being part of. A lot of people ask me whether politics has a lot to do with this, and there are some stories out there, and I've seen some um, cases where um, inappropriate political influence has happened, but for the most part, my experience is it's not an issue. I have seen very well-connected people, um, politically connected people, not get permits and I know for a fact a lot of my clients don't have any political connections and they were able to get permits. So be aware of the political atmosphere. Go talk to your local and state legislators and make sure they're informed about what you're doing and ask them if there's anything on their to-do list that you could incorporate. Those things are great, but I wouldn't rely too much on the political sphere. Some people do hire lobbyists and I have nothing but good things to say about lobbyists, but I don't think that the political um, influence is, is an issue. I want to talk briefly about post application. Um, once the awards are given out, all the people who don't win, <laughs> or a large chunk of them, appeal. There, there's a flurry of litigation. So if you're in litigation right now, that's another avenue that you can step into the medical marijuana realm. There's a ton of appeals. People are very unhappy. They've spent a ton of money, a ton of time. They think that they are the very best candidate and they don't understand why they did not win a permit. For instance, I'm talking about a lot of money. In Pennsylvania, it costs $30,000 just to submit an application. That's money you'll never get back for a grow. Um, permit. Just for them to open the envelope costs $30,000. You have to also stick in that same envelope $200,000 because if you get the award, that's what it costs just to get the award. So it's pricey and people don't, um, don't take lightly to losing when there's this much money involved. So there'll be a lot of those things going around. There's also right to know law issues. Different states call this different um, things, the sunshine laws, the right to know laws. But a lot of people also want to know, they want to peel back the curtain and, and look at what the reviewers saw or did or why they picked certain people to award permits to. And newspapers also are very big on the right to know laws. So there's lots of um, litigation there as well, because if I'm an applicant and I send in a application, I don't want all my trade secrets disclosed to my competitors. So there's a lot of fighting um, there as well. A lot of um, needed work that needs to be done. 
Okay, we're finally, I think, past that area. Let's, I think, go to the next slide. Um, it, medical marijuana impacts a lot of different areas, and I come from an energy background. So, first of all, I love this slide. It's not my kid, but I just love it. Um, and you would be surprised how much medical marijuana does, hopefully you'll be surprised at how much uh, marijuana influences these different areas. Just wanted to show you one area here, energy. Uh, in 2017, ma marijuana growers used approximately 1% of America's total electricity at a cost of about $6 billion. Utility bills for marijuana cultivators can range from $3,000 to $100,000 a month. A 5,000 square foot warehouse filled with hydroponic growing systems, that's with the water, um, can draw five times the electricity of a typical industrial user of the same size. Um, in 2012, cannabis accounted for 3% of a California's electric cons consumption, the equivalent of 1 million homes. So this is an issue for states. It's an issue for utilities. It's a, it, an issue for municipalities who own their own electricity um, supply uh, or distribution chain. And some states are requiring that the um, medical marijuana or the marijuana facilities that are growing the plants actually compensate the grid by installing various renewable sources of energy. Most, you know, common is solar, but that's another for people who like to 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 deal with energy or deal with um, the renewables. That's another area of the law that's um, really taking off where marijuana is concerned. I want to uh, go to the next slide. I would like to introduce you to Mary Cease. Um, she's near and dear to my heart. And um, she's my client. I, I take I took her pro bono. Um, and let me just uh, I took her pro bono for a specific reason. I, I take pro bono cases in this field where I believe that the person can represent the fight that many more people have. And what I mean by that is she is 67 years old. Her income is less than eleven thousand dollars per year. She is certified disabled. She has various rods in her back. She's a Navy veteran. She's fleeing domestic violence, which is documented with hospital records and police records. She has zero criminal record. And the only reason um, that I took her case is because she was on opioids for her back pain. And she just went to her doctor and said, is there some kind of alternative? I hear all these bad things about opioids. Is there a way I can get off of them? And her doctor recommended medical marijuana in Pennsylvania, where it's legal. And she went and she got medical marijuana. She divulged this or disclosed this to her Section 8 housing landlord, who then rejected her out of the um, Section 8 housing. So I took her case because I think it's a fight worth having for a lot of people out there who don't want to be on opioids, who have a legitimate reason to have medical marijuana. They should not, be de they should not have to choose between a roof over their head and their medicine. Nobody makes people choose between Ativan and a roof over their head. It's this is just a, I'm sorry, I feel very passionate about Mary C's. And it's just unconscionable that we have um, a form of government in such conflict between federal and state that if she wants to take advantage of federal housing, she has to go back on opioids. Well, I took her case. And of course, we lost at the um, agency, the housing level. We also lost at the trial level, the lower court. We just had argument in what is called the Commonwealth Court. And for people who aren't from Pennsylvania, Commonwealth Court is a specific high-level court that takes cases that um, when the government is involved. So if any kind of fight with an agency, whether it's social security fight or a tax fight, can ultimately end up in the superior court. If we do not win there, I will take it to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. And um, then we'll see how it goes there. But um, I feel very passionately about Mary Cease and people that are um, in the same predicament as she is. Oh, I forgot to mention, she's also um, American Indian. Um, so she has a lot of these um, different characteristics that I felt that as they come together, um, makes it a good cause to take up that fight. Um, I think we're ready for the next slide. Oh, this is another gentleman. I don't know him. He's not my client. Um, Tanisha and I had wanted to show you this video. It just 
with the internet the way it's um, going these days, it didn't work out to put the link here. We will put the link in your package or on the website after this this particular webinar is over. But let me just tell you, this gentleman has Parkinson's, and the video is, if you haven't seen it already, it's moving because he obviously has Parkinson's. It's bad. Um, and he's part of a study where they put a drop of medical marijuana underneath his tongue and, and then they use time-lapse photography. So the whole video is only two and a half minutes. But you can see he, he returns to re relative normal. He stops shaking. He can speak. Now, it's not a cure. You all have to keep on taking it in order to get the same effect. But it changed his life. It changed his life. Um, it, it gave him back the ability to function, do a job. Um, take a walk with his wife. Um, and I do have friends um, that I can discuss or tell the same kind of stories. One, one of my good friends, um, his son has a rare form of epilepsy and she tried every medication that was out there for her son and nothing worked. Um, she eventually went to Colorado and started him on a high CBD treatment. And for those of you who don't know, marijuana has two main ingredients, CBD and THC. THC is the um, psychoactive ingredient, ingredient or the ingredient that gives you the high. CBD is the other one. And so for epilepsy, uh, the combination, very small THC and very large ratio of CBD is, is found to be very effective. It's so effective that last year, the FDA, the federal government, actually approved a drug called Epidiolex. And that is the first drug ever approved by the FDA that is uh, made from marijuana plants, and it does treat um, child epilepsy. So I wanted to um, tell you about that since we aren't going to be able to show you the slide. Um, and I'll just stay, oh, okay. Um, some other areas um, that you may find medical marijuana impacting is definitely employer-employee law. Uh, employer-employee law is big. Uh, I feel bad for both sides. They're caught between a rock and a hard place. A lot of the states that pass medical marijuana specifically have provisions in the statute that says that no one can be um, persecuted or you know fired from a job uh, simply by having the medical marijuana card. But then on the other hand, they say no employer um, is required to uh, keep a person who is taking medical marijuana if they feel that such would um, be unsafe uh, lose federal funding or be a, um, you know, some kind of liability to the employer. Well, th that's as clear as mud, right? So there's lots of um, cases out there where people are fighting both sides of that story and, and just trying to get some clarity um, from our state and federal government on this. Um, for one reason, for one thing, um, if you have any CDL um, drivers, a commercial driver's license um, employees, they can't have any medical marijuana. They can't even have the over-the-counter CBD, because there might be a trace of THC, and if there's one trace of THC found um, in any kind of um, urine or blood test of a, a commercial driver, they can lose their license for life. So they can lose their career, not just their job. So there's lots of conflict out there in terms of employer-employee um, law. Family law. Um, the state of Pennsylvania has a specific um, provision in their act that says that you cannot a judge can't use the fact that someone has a medical marijuana card or that they're legally taking medical marijuana card as a reason not to grant custody to a parent. If that's the only reason, that cannot be used. And so it does affect family law. I have been called on a number of occasions um, to, for counseling on what, what they can and can't bring up in court in terms of medical marijuana. Schools. Schools are wrestling with this whole medical marijuana. Are, are kids allowed to take medical marijuana? We just I just talked about my friend who had a young child who desperately needs this medication in order to function. Should she, you know, be should her child be allowed to have medical marijuana administered? And if so, who administers it? Is it the school nurse? Is it a parent who has to leave their job and come in and administer it? Um, so there's all kinds of challenges there. Um, Tanisha knows this really well. Our class is working on drafting regulations to submit to the Department of Education on this topic. And there's lots of issues for teachers, principals, parents where this is concerned. 
um, banking. Everybody knows that the federal government still finds marijuana illegal, and banks are predominantly regulated by federal law and federal agencies. And so, it, although many people don't know this, banks are not prohibited from doing um, banking with medical marijuana entities. If they choose to do so, if the bank chooses to work with or service a medical marijuana entity, there are huge amount of restrictions and caveats and actions that the bank has to take to the point where the bank basically becomes a police officer, an investigative agent, and they're liable for all of that. And so most banks don't take on those challenges. There are some that do, um, for instance, Park Bank. If you're looking for, I suppose you have a client that's looking for a bank um, that will do banking with medical marijuana or marijuana, it is Park Bank, P-A-R-K-E. And so um, that's an area of law. Another area of law is taxes. You may or may not know this, but the federal government um, allows people who are doing any kind of drugs, illegal or legal, to file tax returns. Um, and they're allowed to take cost of goods out of their sales before they come to a tax liability. So normal businesses have sales, they subtract out the cost of goods, they get a gross profit, then they subtract all their business expenses like labor and utilities, and they come down to a really small amount that they have to pay taxes on. Medical marijuana, marijuana entities, they don't get that. They get to have their sales minus their cost of goods, that's it, then they have to pay taxes. It's a thing called 280E, um, provision of our tax code that disallows marijuana entities from doing that next step and reducing their tax liability by subtracting out expenses. So huge implications in the tax world for that. Um, also, uh, you know, it's a cash business, uh, medical marijuana, you know, there's not a lot of banks that will do business, you can't do credit cards with them. So there is a concern that that medical marijuana or marijuana um, facilities do become targets, but more um, importantly, uh, patients can become targets. If everyone knows that John Smith patient has to pay for his medical marijuana with cash, then while he's walking into the dispensary, um, he becomes a target. So that's a problem. Especially if John Smith is, is elderly or disabled or of, of any um, compromised condition, um, it, it becomes more of a challenge and more of a target, and it shouldn't be that way. But these things are the, the legal areas that medical marijuana impacts. Um, going to go to the next slide. Trends. Um, that's what we're here about. Um, the trend is toward legalization. Um, I will tell you that 67% of Americans support making marijuana legal recreationally wise. I mean, just making marijuana legal, tax it, regulate it, make sure that it you know, is um, not unsafe, make sure that you can get the tax revenues, use the tax revenues in a productive way, make them part of the regular business mainstream like we do with alcohol. 90% of Americans believe that medical marijuana should be legalized. So the trend is, is not red or blue. It is definitely uh, a trend toward making marijuana legalized. Now, there's a lot of legislation that passed the House that's sitting at the Senate right now. Um, various things from descheduling the marijuana, as you may know, according to the C uh, Controlled Substance Act, there are five schedules that the different drugs go on. Schedule one is prohibited for everyone. Um, and there's um, three criteria for being on Schedule 1. One is that there's no um, medical benefit involved. One is that you have a high um, likelihood of abusing it. And three, that there's no adequate supervision of its administration. Um, obviously, those three don't really apply to marijuana anymore, but it's still stuck on Schedule 1. And so either the Congress can remove it from Schedule 1 or the Attorney General can. And that's not an and, that's an or. The Attorney General could deschedule marijuana. But there are lots of legislation that's calling for descheduling. There's also legislation that's trying to make banking safer for marijuana entities. These are the trends that are coming up. And even where states um, maybe have it legalized recreational marijuana, a lot of states are looking at decriminalizing it. So even if it's not legalized, it can be decriminalized. And that's really, really important. We have people sitting in jail 
for doing the exact same thing. And think about this for a second. They're sitting in jail for doing the exact same thing that 30 governors just came out this month and said were essential businesses. So these people who, who are in jail for, for smoking pot aren't doing anything different than the people who are now allowed to get marijuana through dispensaries because they're open, because they're considered essential businesses. Alcohol stores are not even considered essential businesses. So that's the kind of trend we are, are going with this legalization. It's still a, a mess in terms of the conflict and the disparity and the um, unfairness of it. But I do think that um, it is trending toward legalization. The, we have the majority of people who support it, and there's lots of bills there that can um, make it legal. We just have to um, be motivated to, to, to cause that to happen. I will say, just as a the, the side thing, that um, Pennsylvania ha has not decriminalized it as a state. Um, they let cities decriminalize it, and we have 11 cities that have decriminalized uh, marijuana. Virginia, on the other hand, last week decriminalized it across the whole entire state. So you see the different, that's the other thing, is states take different approaches on how they deal with all of these things. Um, Marijuana is emerging law. It's rare when lawyers get to do something brand new that you know really has never been out there before. It touches so many different areas of other laws. I'm excited about it. I hope, um, I know I talk really, really fast and I covered a lot of things, but I hope that I um, made you know a little bit of interest in you and you wanna delve into it further and maybe even take it on as a career yourselves because I, I, I can say that it's really rewarding. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Tanisha. So part of the trend that we were, we were discussing is that it's an emerging field and where it's going for the future. So part of that was I looked at, um, I went to the LSAC website and looked at all 202 ABA accredited law schools to see which of those law schools actually taught a medical marijuana or a cannabis course of some sort. Of the of the 202 ABA schools, I found that there are only 39 that actually had a course on their curriculum for that. And even of that, there are three that aren't necessarily specific to medical marijuana. They were like agriculture or drug policy in general. And then the other thing which I'm going to do right now is uh, the Leafly app. And I had no idea what the Leafly app was. So I did a lot of research on it. I'm very excited about it. And I'm probably going to talk very fast too. Um, so what is Leafly? It, and their motto is they want to be the world's destination to discover, find, and buy cannabis. It's literally like the Grubhub Yelp of marijuana, cannabis, CBD. It, honest, it covers everything. They really want to educate the consumer. And it's not just about, well, I need to use medical marijuana or I just would like to get high from that um, or if you have some ailments. So I'll go through all of that. But Leafly lets you do pretty much everything across the board. So the website is incredibly user friendly. It's very easy to use. And again, they want to give you a ton of information. So they let you kind of do a deep dive on your own. You can also take a quiz if you're curious about what kind of CBD you should use or what they're recommending for you, or if you're just curious. Um, and then, so navigating, I just went to the website and I did not download the app, but looking at the website, it allows you to look at all of these different um, areas of it to find dispensaries. There obviously, because today is 420, there are a ton of deals available for this right now, um, but you can find mar medical marijuana doctors. You can take, again, a quiz or do more research to educate yourself. And so right now, as you see, Leafly operates in the United States, in Canada, and in Germany, which I thought was actually really pretty interesting. Um, and then if you're just not sure what you're in the mood for, you can search by your mood. Um, so that's one area. There's also, as you see, for your pets, if your pets need anything. Um, you can look just by the wellness of it. If you need to cover certain areas, 
it again it educates you i had no idea what terpene was i thought it was like something paint related but clearly it's not um <laughs> but it tells you about that if you're looking for specific effects and again it lets you search by how you want to feel what your medical ailment may be the phantom limb i thought was interesting because i know that that is definitely an issue for some people um, and if you want to search by flavor or aroma that you're looking for, the ammonia one, I, I don't understand that. The strawberry, the chocolate, I can definitely understand that. The ammonia, not so much. The other thing that I really just truly appreciated about the Leafly app is that it lets you, it gives you all of these great legends. And this all makes sense when I go through another couple of slides but you see the different sizes for the THC and for the CBD. And then there's a color legend as well. And so it tells you what you're kind of getting into. And so I picked the Pineapple Express as just the example. Um, but you see the different, the different shapes and how big it is or how small it is. So it gives you an idea of really what you're getting into. Um, they do reviews what you should expect and then all of these different effects like how people are reporting that they feel by it and they give you detailed descriptions um leafly also works with certified labs they are very big into making sure that everything is completely above board they're very into remaining compliant so that they can continue to operate in jurisdictions so I thought this was really interesting in that for jurisdictions that have unlicensed dispensaries, Leafly will no longer show those on the website or on their apps because again, they want to remain compliant. They want to be able to continue to operate in those jurisdictions. Apple, they've made this regulation that if it's not there, you just can't access it. So again, I thought that was kind of interesting that they really want to make sure that they're doing everything above board, making sure that they're educating the user and providing you with the absolute best thing possible. So I looked quickly through like delivery pickup um, and doctors, and I found that you can do Leafly delivers in California, Oregon, in Las Vegas, Oklahoma, Michigan, and Florida. You can do pickup for it um, in Tennessee, Florida, Maine, a couple places in Canada, Michigan, New York, um, Connecticut, Vermont, yes, Vermont. Um, and then again, you can look for doctors and dispensaries as well. So just a plethora of information. I, I, I would definitely recommend taking a look at the website. It's endlessly fascinating. I think that is actually, yep, that is the end of our presentation. So I'm gonna, Wibble we'll back really quickly to the beginning of our slides, and then we can start questions and answers that pe or questions that people may have. Great. Well, we have lots of questions. So if anyone else has questions, please add them to the chat. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start because there's some great questions. Um, this one: Is there a limit on the number of applications approved slash a maximum number of permitted growers and or dispensaries? Tanisha, do you want to answer that? <laughs> yes, and it's going to vary by jurisdiction. And I think so. One question that I have to kind of follow up to that is yes, there are a number of applications, a number of, of things that are permitted, a, a number of awards that are um, given. But so, how many applications can somebody submit? Do you know, or is there a limit to the number of applications one person can submit? Um, that's an excellent question. So to answer the first question, yes, each state will have, and each time they go out for application um, submission. So for instance, um, Penn, Pennsylvania has had two, New Jersey has had three application timeframes. So they will go out in phases and each of those phases will have restrictions. The first time Pennsylvania went out there and we had 12 growers that were gonna be awarded and they had over 200 applications. So that gives you a ratio. Um, Pennsylvania has allowed a total of 25 growers um, through those two phases, uh, and they were having 50 um, dispensary permittees. Now, each of those 50 
dispensary permittees are allowed to have three sites. So there's going to be 150 dispensaries. A grow can only have one site in Pennsylvania. And that's similar in New Jersey as well. And Maryland uh, divides processors away from growers. So you can get a grower's license or a processor license. But they, again, they're only picking the top 10 in this latest phase that they um, just issued. So yes, there's absolute uh, restrictions on how many permits are out there and where they're placed. Um, and uh, to answer your question, Tanisha, there's not a lot of restrictions on how many you can submit. It, you know, if you wanna put $30,000 in an envelope five times, knock yourself out. And the, if you only win once, that's just the, the price of playing. Great, we have another question. Are already in the farming industry or are they investors who hire someone with a specific knowledge? Ooh, that's a really good question. Uh, a lot of my, cl my clients are very eclectic. Um, I don't think any of them came from farming. They come from pharmaceutical um, and they come from finance mostly. They do hire substantive people to do, they all have like grow house managers um, that will, will do that work for them, but not a lot of farmers stepped up. Now my hemp clients, yes, total, almost all of them farmers. For the application process, would the dispensaries have to show how they plan to advertise their product to the public for medical or, or, and or recreational use, as in, such as TV ads, radio ads, social media, internet, et cetera? Okay, most states will have really tight restrictions on that. Um, and they're, um, they're not allowed to advertise in a lot of places in a lot of ways. And um, although that's not specific to the application, it's an ongoing regulatory issue. In other words, every single time any of my clients want to advertise in any way, they have to get pre-approved. Um, if someone applies and is dispensary, is there a limited number of times they can reapply? You, you kind of uh, was a little fuzzy in the beginning. I think you're asking if they lose, can they reapply in the next phase? Yes, if that's what you asked. Yes, and is there a limit on how many times they can reapply? No, it, there's not. In fact, um, we, had, uh, we have a, actually a different category of permits in Pennsylvania. We have what's called a CR permit, that's clinical registrant. It's the first of its kind in the country. They're supposed to be set up to just do exclusively research. And um, we actually went to battle with the Department of Health, who is our regulatory agency here, because um, some applicants who had failed in phase one and phase two of the regular permitting process were applying for CR status. And we just felt that if they couldn't cut it in the regular um, phase applications, why should they be given this special license to do research? But um, to answer your question, I hope that answers your question. Here's another one. Is there an approximate amount of funding someone would need in order to think about opening such a business? Yes. Um, for growers, um, I say that your minimum is $12 million. Um, but if you're a dispensary, I say your minimum is probably right around a million. Um, let's see. I have a friend. This is the person, not me. I have a friend who worked in a dispensary for a while and said there had been an issue with medical marijuana cards and gun licenses um, when he was in Colorado. I'm wondering if you have any information about how marijuana law affects gun licenses in various states. Well, Tanisha, do you want to take this? We just had an assignment on this. <laughs> we literally just talked about this. So I don't mean to put you on the spot. Yes. Um, <laughs> The, generally speaking, you can, if you come into this and apply for the medical marijuana card and you already have firearms, you are okay to keep your firearms. Nobody is going to come in and take them away from you. However, you may not seek new firearms. That is a restriction and it's a constant battle. Um, one that I foresee continuing to play out. Um, but yeah, it's if you come in with it, yes, you can keep them, but you may not get new ones. And Tanisha, what's the case that stands for that proposition? Do you remember? V. Lynch. Yay. My work here is done. <laughs> <laughs> um, to your knowledge, are there restrictions as to whether a person or entity can simultaneously hold alcohol and cannabis licenses? Um, it says, I would assume this would be jurisdictional. 
Um, can they hold both? There, I have no, no restrictions where someone cannot hold both. I have a client who holds both. Um, basic question regarding attorney rule number one. For applications, do you bill hourly or flat fee? That's an excellent question as well. I've done both. Um, it, it's really risky doing the flat fee because um, a lot of my clients believe that they have camera ready applicant applications um, only to find out that they do not. And it's a ton of work if they don't have something that's really ready to go. Um, we make sure we are meticulous. Every single piece of that application gets reviewed by at least two attorneys, sometimes three, if I can, if I can fit it in. Um, we want zero mistakes, no, no punctuation mistakes, no grammar mistakes, no, uh, you know, anything out of line. So, um, because we don't want the reviewer to stop and go, hey, they, they can't even get their punctuation right. We're going to trust them with a medical marijuana license, you know. So, um, I like hourly better um, because of that. Um, but I have done set fees, and you know, they, they run around fifty thousand per per application. So, just sorry, Michelle. Um, on average, how many hours are you spending per application, or does that vary by jurisdiction? It varies by type. I'll spend far more type and type of client and type of permit. If a client is a novice and doesn't isn't used to this, doesn't have some um, substantive work already done, it's a ton of work. Um, also, growers are more work than than dispensaries. Um, so, does that answer the question? No, that's great. Um, are there citizenship requirements for permit holders? Yes, and not only are there citizenship in terms of U.S. versus foreign, but there are sometimes citizenships per state. Some states will require, such as Ohio, that you are a resident of that state for at least six months prior to the application period. Great, and then I had a question. What kind of, if, if I'm looking to get into this, um, get into this field, either as a law student coming out of law school or, you know, an attorney looking to add this to my practice area, um, what advice would you give? What kind of barriers to entry are there? Or um, you know, what, just what advice would you give someone looking to join the field? Well, the first thing you need to do is relook at your engagement letter. Our engagement letter um, would never suffice. We have all kinds of um, additional caveats and warnings in our uh, engagement letter that we um, give out for cannabis clients versus our other legal clients. And we have a law firm called Hawk McEwen and SNSCAC. Cannabis law was something I specifically started within our um, law firm. Um, but I redid my engagement letter, and that was like the first step in really making sure that I was communicating with my potential clients about the risks and the conflicts that were involved in this practice group. Um, and I just try to stay true to that when I counsel all my clients that, you know, certain, they have to be doing it a better and above, um, uh, you know, any other business. And I'll, I'll throw in one little thing here that's important that we didn't talk about in our presentation. Um, but, but there's a little thing that you may have heard of called Robocker, Robocker Farr Amendment. It's an amendment to the federal budget that doesn't supply any money to the attorney general um, or the FBI or anybody else to investigate or prosecute any entity, any medical marijuana entity that is compliant with state law. So even if the, the attorney general wants to go after a dispensary in Pennsylvania, as long as that dispensary is adhering to Pennsylvania law, they don't have the funds to do it. And that's key. That's why I tell my clients, you can't take risks, you can't cut corners, you've got to do everything right. So if I could kind of build off of what Michelle was asking, if I, if I, if graduating this, this actually in a few weeks, if I graduating, once I graduate and I decide that I would like to get into this, could I just hang up my own shingle or hang up a shingle, you know, under somebody else, obviously being licensed or even if I wasn't licensed, is this something that I could just decide that I wanted to do? You can. You have to be very well informed and you have to inform your client that you're not giving them legal advice, that you're giving them consulting advice. Your engagement letter has to call yourself a consultant and not a lawyer because you, you obviously, for obvious reasons, you want to do it, but you could do consulting. And if you wanted to join a law firm today and you weren't able to take the LSATs, not the LSATs, a, the bar, sorry, my daughter's thinking about going to law school. Um, if you couldn't take the bar and you couldn't get your license yet, but you still wanted to look, work at a law firm, you certainly could, because there's lots of work that still can be done by law clerks and graduating law students before they actually get their license um, in this area. There's lots to do, still do. 
Are there any last questions? Actually, I had two questions that I wrote down when you were talking. Um, when you were talking about adding pictures to the application, could you use pictures in lieu of the description or is that an addition to? It's always an addition to because you want to talk about how that equipment works and what, how you're going to use it and where you're going to put it. But the picture really does help the flow and the reviewer fatigue. And then when you were talking about um, where the individual was going to use the site or um, identifying sites, can that already be pre-identified when, when the person comes to you and says, I would like to put in an application to be a grower or dispensary, and this is where I've already identified my site? Sometimes, sometimes it can be. Um, you just have to be careful because the state sometimes dictate, well, we're going to, we're going to allow seven permits in Montgomery County, but we're not allowing any in, let's say, Lehigh County. That's not true, but, but, but let's just say they say that. And your site is in Lehigh County. Well, then what do you do? So sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. That's a good question. I don't have anything else. Does anybody else have any more questions? Great. Well, this, thank you both so much, Judith and Tanisha. This has been a really great webinar tons of great information. Um, for everyone, thank you for joining. This is going to be placed on the Filefit Delta YouTube channel within the next few days. So um, look for it, recommend it to your friends. If you wanna watch it again, it'll be there. And also the video that they, um, that Judith and Tanisha talked about earlier, we'll have a link to that as well so you can see that video. Again, thank you. Thank you to the executive office and everyone who joined Judith and Tanisha. Thank you so much. Have a good night.